Okay, uh, looks like I got everything going. Had some lighting issues. I was really in the dark. I, cause I changed it because I, so I could stand just because I was getting tired of sitting. And I hope everyone can see me. It looks like I'm relatively clear on there. And uh, just do a few more things about the Battle of France. Actually, this is a, in many ways a climatic moment of history. If things would have gone a little bit differently for Germany here, we'd have an entirely different course of history. In fact, it's almost unimaginable how things would have been different. It really is. It's one of those great what ifs. What if Germany would have been a little bit better prepared and or France would have been better prepared, better intelligence and not been so defeated. Sorry, I'm setting up a couple screens. I have a sort of a jerry rig system of different screens set up. It's not the best system, but it's what we have to work with. And so I'm going to go through the invasion of Russia, actually the climatic moments of world history. And once again, here's another moment where the United States was relatively out of it. As I mentioned on Wednesday, Thursday, on Thursday, no, Wednesday, today is, is Thursday. By the way, is everyone here? Can everyone hear me? I have yesterday's video on. Let me get to... All right, can you see Battle of France and German soldiers marching by the, um, by the Arc de Triomphe? Okay, as I mentioned yesterday, the United States passed the Neutrality Acts, at first saying they would not trade with any belligerents, and that goes back to that World War I fear, World War I fear of bankers forcing the United States into war. But then, the United States did... So I'm in, I'm in the light, can you see me? All right. And then the United States in 1939 did cash and carry, where the United States will loan no money. In fact, it became illegal to for Americans to buy bonds to loan money to the British to buy munitions. The British have got to come up with hard currency. Well, British, French, whoever, but clearly soon it's going to be just Britain. And so that's where we're at right now. A couple, a uh, little, little bit more review, but since I got to do a couple announcements, and the announcements are basically this. For the maps, I'm getting a lot of your maps in. You guys are doing really well on it. A few people uh, miss a couple little things, but I'm not going to take points off of you don't have Stalingrad exactly where it's supposed to be as long as you have a good idea where it is. And the same thing with the Pacific Islands. I know the Pacific is so vast, and to get a map that big, you can hardly see the points, so you have to kind of guess. But the Battle of the Philippine Sea was this massive battle that stretched basically between the Philippines and Guam, which is an area that's hard to even imagine the size. And so... Those are the kind of things I was looking for. And I was just kind of reinforced not only where the battles were, give you an idea, but also the scope of this thing. And if you're having trouble, for example, printer issues or things like that where you can't copy it, please let me know. I have to make a matching for this. So I'm going to make it up right, right after I'm done with this. And I'm just basically going to number it and put letters. Number the... Uh, number of the things you're supposed to label, put letters on the map, and then have you match it. it, it something really simple. If you need that, just drop me a line, and I will send you, I have to do a picture, because uh, I'm having some scanner issues, but I think you understand how that is. And the same thing is, I understand how you're going through some issues, uh, if you have access to the computer, how you get the access to the computer, and you have multiple people using it. Uh, so I have the same thing where I'm working upstairs and my wife is working downstairs. So the same thing is happening with me. And if you remember, I will accept late work if something happens. I understand what's going on. But tomorrow we do have a quiz. And I will open it up for a few days. But please get it done relatively fast. And it's going to be another one of those 10 quick multiple choice. And just a quick little reading quiz. Uh, starting next week, we'll start working more on thesis statements and DBQ stuff. I want you to start looking at it on your own. I've talked about it many times. And part of this you have to do on your own and also have that review packet. And so please start going through that. Remember the review packet, what I'm looking for is pages one through the third way through page six, which is the election of 1896. Um, that is the stuff you got to work on. 
same deal. If you're having printer issues, please let me know. All right, so let's get back to quick review. So we're through all the things about Czechoslovakia, Austria, Germany grabbing material or grabbing uh, just Hitler's grabbing whatever he can get. And he lied at Munich. Don't forget, Munich became the definition, the equality of appeasement equal. They, they were the same thing. And then Hitler pushed uh, Poland over the Polish corridor, invaded, but this time Britain and France did declare war. But to shock everybody, there was the Molotov-Ribbentrop or the Hitler-Stalin pact, this non-aggression pact. And don't forget, the big thing was oil. Germany got the oil for their military. But don't forget also, I told you that the German military knew they were not ready for war. They had about a million men in uniform when the war began, and they would quickly mobilize up to four million. I'm using quotes because these are four million men who were not yet ready to fight. And even though birth rates in Germany exploded in the 1930s, 1920s were when they needed the high birth rate, and 1920s was such a turbulent time, it didn't, excuse me, it didn't, they didn't quite get the birth rate in that. It's the age of young men will fight. But don't forget also that the young men who would make up the Nazis, that was that blockade generation that was hurt by the Allied blockade, especially, to their memory, the blockade that happened six months after the war ended. I'm just a little corner figure here. I'm going to make myself just a little bit bigger so you can see my aggressive hand gestures. So, Poland fell relatively fast. It went into the Sitzkrieg or phony war. That's when Russia did the uh, uh, Russia attacked Finland for the Winter War, and then Germany attacked Denmark and Norway, and that's where you get Quisling, which became synonymous with traitor. It's not used as much anymore, but every once in a while, I might even call somebody a Quisling, and that means you're a traitor. <laughs> what are Quislings? Okay, so let's get back to this then. The real Sitzkrieg, though, the phony war, would end and blow up in the face of the French and the British on May 10th. And there's still fighting going on at Narvik in northern Norway. So this, I guess, a beautiful fjord. So the Battle of France. In reality, this is part one of World War II. This is where Hitler could get his revenge for Versailles and finally defeat the French. And so that is a bad sign for the French, the picture I showed. So let's get back to this. Here are the placements of the troops for both armies. Here is the Maginot Line, which effectively barred German attack here. So the French and the British and everybody knew that they were going to have to attack through Belgium. That was the plan. When people think, and they'll say this all the time, they'll say like a Maginot Line mentality, that the French would hide by, behind the Maginot Line and the Germans went, just went around that implying that the French had no idea the Germans could go around it. That is simply untrue. The French and the British actually had a pretty good plan. They knew the Germans couldn't attack through Switzerland, and so they would meet them in Belgium. Now, poor little Belgium, which was neutral, would not allow French and British troops in. They were worried about this would trigger some kind of German attack. But as soon as Germany invaded, the British and French would march up to this called the Dial River and stop them right there. And, to the French point of view, we'll keep the fighting out of France. So, that's the plan. And I showed you those pictures of the Maginot Line. It is amazing, these defenses. Because they're all still there. But I also told you that this Ardennes Forest region, narrow valleys, this area right here, i got to get the... right there. Belgium only had a couple cavalry brigades. And... French put reserves. They put their reserves here, and these were second-level troops who had been in the army years ago. They had no anti-tank weapons because the thought was there would be no major attack. And so the Maginot Line extended to here, basically, and then stopped. Big opening right here, and they heard the best troops. So the Germans had changed their plan to instead of the Schlieffelin plan again, to fake an attack here, well, have an, a diversionary attack through the Netherlands and Belgium, then the main force here, and then cut off the British forces. And so, the British and French forces. Germans had a good but risky plan. And there was another almost coup attempt right here. 
A lot of the German generals were still furious with this. That's why they were so unenthusiastic about their planning before the attack on France. And they thought about it, but they lost their nerve. And this would be crucial for all world history because Hitler, in one of the last times of his life, really endorsed a very risky plan. And let me rephrase that, a risky plan that was a good plan. And he was right. And there would be rejoicing in Germany for revenge for the Treaty of Versailles. And after 1940, it was almost impossible for German generals to do anything after it. How could they deny it? Hitler seems to be right. And the people were behind him. Yes, I know there would, many, there would be many coup attempts, especially uh, July 17, 1944, the most famous one. But by then, it was, frankly, too late. So back to this. So that's the plan. And so on May 10th, the Sitz Creed was shattered, even though still fighting in Norway. The invasion of France began. And so the first moves, and this is why this is from a great book called Strange Victory that I photocopied and brought out because it's such a good book. The German attack went into oops, Holland and Belgium. And Holland held out, Holland, the Netherlands, sorry, held out for four days. The Germans parachuted, used parachutes for the parachutists for the first time. They called Foschemagers to take uh, Dutch bridges um, over the dikes and got behind the Dutch defenses that were not very well uh, positioned. They didn't have enough troops and Holland would fall. fall. But this, the major town and one of their, they kind of have three capitals, Rotterdam. Rotterdam would be terror bombed just like Warsaw was in 1939 to force uh, Dutch surrender on May 14th, 1941. But they also attacked through Belgium. And they attacked here and to the German or to the British and the French, all right, we knew they were coming because we captured their plans. I told you about that yesterday. They advanced into Belgium and began to organize on this line right here. And by doing that, in fact, there'd be fighting here by May 11th and May 12th. They missed the biggest part of the German army advancing through the Ardennes. Even when reconnaissance saw them, they discounted it. They totally discounted it until the Germans emerged four days later right here at Sedan. And so, the first moves, in fact, there'd be a massive tank battle right here between French and German tanks. And the tanks, I'm just going to show you a couple things real quick. These are the French tanks. And the French actually had better and more tanks than the Germans. Here are a couple of light tanks, but this is a Soma tank right here. This is one at a museum I took a picture of. And these tanks were better than anything the Germans had. There were some flaws in it, don't get me wrong, and they would be obsolete within a year. But they had better tanks. These were actually German soldiers inspecting French tanks after the war, or after the France fell. They included had this massive heavy tank called the Char B that German shells just simply bounced off, at least their tank shells. Their anti-aircraft gun, it's called an 88, would go through them. Uh, the problem was they were slow and hard to maneuver. Their main gun was down here. And they only could move about five miles an hour. And so, oh, and one more thing. The French were so worried about German intelligence reading their, or picking up and uh, the radio transmissions that none of their tanks had radios. And this would be a, cru a crucial disadvantage when the war happened. But the only reason I show you this is because I want to show you this massive tank they built, uh, the, the Char B, or the Char B-10. And this tank had a 17-man crew, weighed 60 tons. It's a monstrosity. Look at how many men are in the, the, the crew of this thing. The thought was that it would be like a, a um, battleship on land, and nothing could match up to it. Needless to say, here is one destroyed in the lower right. They were so slow and so unmaneuverable that the Germans just could get behind it, attack their rear armor, and blow it away. They even had not only a turret in front, but they had a turret in back with a machine gun. It was insane. The Germans were trying to make a monster tank like this. They called the mouse, get it? And the United States would, and after World War II, it became the craze. 
for both the West and the East to build these monstrosity tanks. But they were always too slow and too unmaneuverable. So, a couple more things here. The British did have some tanks, but they operated under the idea that they would have fast-moving tanks like this, called a cruiser tank, but very lightly armored. And so, in reality, could not stand up to the German tanks, which weren't very well armored either, but more than this. Or, very slow-moving infantry tanks, this is called a Matilda, that had very slow, they would go with infantry, men on the ground, and they would just drive slowly next to them. And the reason I'm showing you this is that they had tanks that the Matilda, German shells, just bounced right off the armor. But they spread them out amongst all forces until it was too late that they began to focus on one point. Remember I told you about Blitzkrieg, where the Germans would use their tanks and focus them all in one spot. And ironically, the German tanks, one-on-one, -on -one, were not a match to most of the French tanks and at least the Matilda for the Germans. They still have these light tanks that they made at first with only a machine gun. Here, which is a small cannon. This is a tank they had later on with a better cannon called the Panzer Mark III, but they weren't great tanks. But Germany put them all together at one point. So if they couldn't win with superiority of tanks, they could win by overwhelming the enemy at one spot. And they would do the same thing against the Russians. German tanks were inferior to the Russian tanks in 1941, but they focused on one spot. So, here are a couple more. This is a Panzer IV tank. This tank they would actually use for the rest of the war. Here I just put this in there because that is a Czech tank. The Czechs actually made a decent tank for 1938, and the Germans just had them keep making those, and they just changed, they just took them over. And eventually these would be for anti-tank gun carriers. They would use this. All right. But their slogan, their idea was called Blitzkrieg. We talked about this once before. But they would use their tanks at one spot, break through, and then go as fast as they can behind the enemy lines. Don't stop. Don't worry about this Blitzkrieg shows encircle. Well, the encirclement would be way down the road. The big thing was to penetrate. Have the tanks penetrate and go. And so here are German tanks advancing through France after they broke through the Ardennes. Here's the man who came up with the term Blitzkrieg, a German general by the name of Heinz Guderian. And there he is. He would lead one of the Panzer tank corps in the invasion of France. He was your typical right-wing anti-communist German general who liked Hitler only because he built the army up. He was never really a Nazi. I'm not trying to defend him. He was not a good person necessarily. But the plan was to break through and go. And France was a perfect place. Once they broke through, they just have the tanks go full speed behind the enemy lines and advance. And the big thing was, as they advanced, they would use air power to knock out any defenses they saw as they went. Because they would outrun, they would outrun their uh, infantry. Most of the German forces, over 90%, was still mar they were still marching and their artillery was horse-drawn. And so the idea was these, all the tanks focused on one spot would advance through French lines and then air power would attack. And they took the French completely by surprise, knocked out a lot of French planes on the ground that May 10th, and they used a new weapon called a dive bomber or Stuka. They weren't a very good plane in reality. They were already pretty much obsolete. The, they didn't have like retractable landing gear. They were slow, not maneuverable. But when they knocked, they took the French by surprise, knocked out much of their air power, they could fly unmolested. And they would attack everything on the ground. So as the French started retreating, that's a fine target. And they put sirens on these Stukas with the idea being that this would add to the panic. So please, I hope the siren sound works. This is what it sounded like. This is it. Could you hear the siren? And that siren 
would, why is there 10 things you never knew about Tombstone? Why would I care about Tombstone? Okay, I hope you can hear the siren. And let me try one more time, just because I want to see if it works. And so this siren would lead to the panic, especially part of the strategy of Blitzkrieg was to get civilians to run away. It happened in Poland and it would happen in Belgium and France. Oops. So this is the panic that it would create. All of a sudden, as they broke through, the plan was to get refugees hitting the roads, people fleeing the German invasion. They remember World War I, where the Germans sent especially young people, teenagers, to become slave laborers back in Germany. And they would be targets too. But think about how this panic would ripple all across France and, oh, we've lost, it's over. But combined with one more thing, French and British troops either could not retreat effectively to fight again because they had to go through uh, panicked civilians, but how do you get reinforcements to the front when you have to go through panicked civilians? So this is a little bit of a film, archi film archive showing civilians running away. This is France, 1940. And this kind of panic, I mean, just imagine if you're sitting out at home on their German planes flying over, and you look out the window and you see all these people running away. What would your first move be? Probably thinking, run away too. So, surprising everybody, there would be a massive, before we get to Sudan and breakout, I told you there'd be a massive tank battle right here on the edge of the Ardennes where that main force advancing through the Ardennes of the Germans met one of the few full-fledged uh, French armored divisions. And this would be the biggest tank battle in history up to that time, and one of the two or three biggest tank battles ever. Hundreds of French and German tanks battled in these Belgian plains just north of Sedan. And that picture I show above is Sedan. By the way, that is along the Meuse River, and you can see how rough and rugged that area is. You can see why the French thought no armored forces could advance through there because they'd be tied to the roads, and therefore it'd be easy to block a road, they're stopped. But of course, you gotta block the roads first. So this massive tank battle, and the French won. The French won and drove the German tanks back. But because of lack of radios and such horrible French intelligence, they didn't even realize they won. And instead of exploiting the battle and the victory, they pulled back. This gives you an idea why this is the French, <laughs> this is a, it's called a strange victory, and the French should not have lost, which they've never gotten over. So, at Sedan, right here, the Germans reached their and reach that, and the French were totally taken by surprise. They pushed men across the river and defeated the French forces who never, they lacked the heavy equipment and were shocked at how fast the Germans moved. You know, the Germans got to the river and just threw men across, started making pontoon bridges and went. Remember I showed you pontoon bridges in the Civil War. And they broke through in just a few days into the battle by by. May 15th, they're breaking through into the open French plan. And this is where they totally baffled the French and the German, or French and the British. When they broke through here, what the French thought is they would either hook around and attack the Maginot Line or go right to Paris. Instead, they shot this way and went to the English Channel. Totally surprising them. Absolutely shocking the British and the French. They advanced that way and it was a couple days before they realized they were even doing it. They thought they were just maybe reconnaissance unions. And this was full blitzkrieg. They just went as fast as they could go. And the French highway system, newly paved, well built, they just drove right down the roads. And within just a few days, within 10 days, they advanced all the way to the sea and cut off, you see where I'm here, all the best British and French forces. It happened so fast. One problem was supply. The German forces were out running through their supply, but the German tanks operated on, with petrol. Now you might be thinking, petrol? That wouldn't be good for a tank, because petrol, if there's a spark, explodes. And yeah, that's a bad thing. 
That's why uh, tanks would operate as soon as they could under diesel. If you need to buy diesel fuel, it's harder to burn. You can burn it, but it doesn't just explode. It's not as combustible. Of course, that's also the reason why diesel engines might be harder to start in, let's say, cold weather. That's another story. Well, what the Germans did is they literally just stopped at French gas stations. Just stopped at French gas stations that were already established along the roads. And I'm blocking this a little bit. Let me shrink me. They just stopped and fueled up. They just stopped and pumped gas right in for the gas stations. And here's the thing. They didn't even pay. Can you believe that? How could you not pay? All right, so here are German tanks advancing across the French countryside. And here are German tanks. And right here is a half track. So half treads, half wheels. And they carried German infantry called grenadiers. Here, though, is the majority of German forces. They followed behind marching. And the thing about it is, is that they're going to be exhausted. The tanks are going to break down. But fortunately, it's not that far to go. You might realize, and you might be thinking, oh, but wait a second. Wouldn't Russia be a lot bigger? So, ironically, totally ironically, but it happened at the exact same time that Germany started the or ended, start the Battle of France and ended the Sitzkrieg formally. Neville Chamberlain had to resign. I put down fire, but he resigned his position as head of the British government. Now remember, back in 38, he was seen as a hero. Here he is with his cabinet right here. But after Czechoslovakia was fully taken, Chamberlain realized the folly of his ways and he had to accept that Germany was a real threat. Britain started to rearm slowly, and in the process, he also had to uh, increase his cabinet, including bringing somebody back who had been totally disgraced by actions in World War I and in the 1920s. They brought him back as First Lord of the Admiralty, which he held at the beginning of World War I, ironically. This man right here, Winston Churchill, was brought back into the cabinet. He was kind of a backbencher. Uh, had, um, this uprising politician had lost all his credibility by the 1930s, but he never quit warning about Hitler. Churchill, very intelligent, very persuasive, but also kind of had some issues, made a lot of bad decisions. He was right in this context. But what happened in Norway, and that's Narvik right there, this was such a disaster that Chamberlain and the government he created that also included members of the opposition party, the brand new Labour Party, they, um, he had to resign or this went, might tumble the entire English government. And a new coalition was created. But the thing was, this is on May 10th, had nothing to do with the German attack on France. It just happened this way. But one of the great what ifs in history, Lord Halifax, this very tall man, right next to Chamberlain and Mussolini in Munich in 1938, Halifax was a foreign minister. And Halifax never hated France. He actually was not a very accomplished foreign minister. At least you look at what the potential could have been. But Halifax was, at best, convinced that France was doomed to, def um, doomed to lose to Germany. And Germany should not... Germany... Uh, should be allowed to defeat the Soviets if they fight some way down the road. He, at best, thought that Germany should um, Germany's going to win and why fight him? At worst, he was a Nazi sympathizer. And he was convinced that Germany should win and he might have sued for peace. He would have been the first choice, the first choice to become prime minister. It's unimaginable how world history would have been different if Halifax would have been the one, if Halifax would have been the one to take power. That means that Britain might have quit the war after France fell and everything would be different. All bets are off. But fortunately, mostly labor members of, uh, labor party members said, we won't accept Halifax. And they reluctantly accept Churchill. 
Churchill ironically would seen as a compromise because Churchill was one of those men who f opposed or wanted to do something about Germany. And Churchill took power on May 10th. And 10 days into the Battle of France, when the Germans arrived at the coast and Britain realized that they were cut off from the rest of France, he would make a decision that would have repercussions for all of time. He decided that we've lost. There is no way we can sit in Belgium. We're not going to break through the German defenses. I should add there would be a couple attempts, you can see it right here on this map, by the British and the French to break through the Germans, but it was half-hearted, never fully formed, including tank, French tank units under a young um, a young and very tall general by the name of Charles de Gaulle, he decided we're going to have to pull the British troops out of Belgium. we got to get them out. And they have hardly fought. They have hardly fought. And so they began to retreat to the coast, and they kept this secret from the French. The French, when they found out we're furious, you're abandoning them. And this would taint French and British relations, and therefore French and American relations, all through today. You abandon us. Now, you could argue that it was stupid British and French intelligence, but still. All right. So, in the process, they begin to pull back to the only real harbor that was left. And it's not a big harbor. It's right here at a place called Dunkirk. And the German main force were here. And the British began to pull back. And the French had no choice but to pull back. And some Belgian forces began to pull back. And this is where Hitler will make fatal mistake number one. Hitler, he was right. They broke through and cut out the French forces, a victory beyond anybody's comprehension, and he lost his nerve. Instead of ordering the exhausted and beat up armored divisions, German panzer divisions who had made it to here, they were exhausted, but he should have ordered them to clear the coast, to take these harbors so the British and French can't retreat, can't escape. He ordered them to stop and what's called refitting. Bring up supplies, repair equipment, bring in replacements, which had very few replacements. They had virtually no reserves. Germany used all the reserve. They used everything in this attack. And that's something that Hitler knew all of a sudden. He's like, oh, we have nothing left. We won this great victory. I can't believe we did it. He lost his nerve at that moment. By giving the British and the French by giving them about three weeks, so from May 25th, or I'm sorry, from about May 15th all the way to about June 7th, he gave them that chance, actually about a week in total, but to pull back to Dunkirk and pull out. So by the time the Germans did attack and tried to drive into Dunkirk and take it, it was too late. Mostly French forces were able to hold off the Germans and allow the British to retreat to Dunkirk and escape. And so in June 1940, the British began to evacuate at Dunkirk. And what Churchill did is he got every he got uh, yep he got every ship Everything that would float, commandeered them, put Royal Navy reservists on these civilian ships, and they sent them overseas. Now, there was a movie on the, a movie that happened a uh, was it a year ago, or two years ago, called Dunkirk. And it was a good movie, uh, a little confusing, but a good movie. But it tried to show civilians taking civilian ships and evacuating British troops at Dunkirk. No, for the most part, it was civilian ships commandeered by reservists in the Royal Navy who were civilians, but just recently, but they were reservists. But still, it made a good movie. It's a good movie. I recommend it. 
and they pulled back to the coast. Now the German Air Force, Luftwaffe, bombed and bombed and bombed. The men on the beach as they waited to be picked up, uh, they bombed and made it the piers and the wharves at Dunkirk unusable, so they had to take them directly off the beach. But the Royal Air Force was able to knock down enough and give just enough for the British to pull out. So here is the headline from, where's my mouse? From Time Magazine showing the troops retreating in the basically the first week of June. Here is propaganda sent by Nazi Germany and they drop these on French soldiers based, and British soldiers, but the French soldiers just escape, you're surrounded, and also telling the French, the British are leaving you, don't fight hard. But the French fought hard and kept the Germans out. So they dropped these leaflets to try to get them to surrender. And here they are being evacuated by small boats, and these um, small boats would go right up to the beach and take men right off the beach to bigger boats that sailed across. That's one thing, the Royal Navy was still very powerful, and even though they lost a lot of ships, they were able to pull out more men than anyone ever thought. Now, most of these men did not have any equipment. They did not have, uh, in fact, most of them didn't even have their rifle, but all their heavy gear, all their tanks, artillery, ammunition, they couldn't bring. All they could bring was themselves. But at the end of the week, Churchill, who was hoping that his move might pull out 100,000 men, pulled out nearly 350,000 troops. Pulled them off, got them back to Britain. About 100,000 of them were French. Pulled them off. And this would be crucial. And I didn't put this down, but put this down here. With this, Britain was able to stay in the war. If they wouldn't have been able to pull out the only really trained troops in the British Army, if they wouldn't have pulled them out, it would have been almost impossible for Churchill to keep Britain in the war. In fact, they were considering leaving the war a month and a half afterwards. And once again, all bets are off about history would have changed. This changed everything. Dunkirk. It was a horrible, humiliating defeat. But because it kept Britain in the war and Britain would win, they almost look at it as a glorious event. And once again, it gets back to Dunkirk. That's why I like that movie. It does tie in this kind of like we saved them. It's a little glorious with the hell of how awful it is. It's well done. And unfortunately for most of the French soldiers, 100,000 of the French soldiers who got back to Britain, almost all of them would go back to France at a place called Cherbourg. And so they could fight again, because you can imagine they want to fight for France and they would end up surrendering to the Germans there. And so that is Dunkirk. And with that, Germany got to this line right here. Let's backtrack here. Here's where the German line was. Belgium had surrendered, the Netherlands had surrendered, and by June 10th, uh, France was in real trouble. And I'm not gonna go through all the issues of this. What happened was, but they were mad at the British, their government collapsed. They went through three different commanding generals, all in their 70s. Uh, they kind of picked these fossils out who still were thinking they were fighting World War I. And they got every reserve out they could. But while the French were thinking a long-term war and marshalling their reserves, Germany attacked with everything. And so on June 10th, when Germany attacked, there would be hard fighting along this line right here. Really hard fighting. But after four days, after four days, the line broke and panic set in. Uh, the French government ran away, started running south, and it fell apart fast. Paris was named an open city and, and fell June 14th. You can see right here, they got behind the Maginot Line, and even though Maginot Line was never defeated, all those forces would surrender. And Churchill tried everything to try to keep France in the war. He even offered to have a unification of government between the United Kingdom and France, have like a unified country. And I'm not sure how that would have worked, but they were desperate to keep them into the war. And it didn't work. And by June 22nd, 
an armistice was signed and France would fall. Before we get to that though, Italy, who Mussolini knew they were not ready for war at all, but he, thinking it's over, and he wanted a piece of the peace settlement. He wanted to get something from the big treaty they would have ending the war, because he thought it's over. He declared war on France and therefore war on Britain, and that would pull Italy into the war. And so, they would attack France. These are Italian forces advancing in the Alps. Advancing in the Alps right here. And there's, of course, Mussolini holding a lion cub. So, Italy would attack. And here's the 22nd. France did surrender. I put down the 25th because the actual armistice took, uh, would take hold on the 25th. But they surrendered on the 22nd. And Hitler made the French surrender in the very same rail car that Germany was humiliated back on November 11th, 1918. And here he is marching out of it. He's right there, accepting the surrender from the French over here. And here he is stomping his foot down uh, in almost glee after they won. After he got the French surrender, all the humiliation of World War I has been resolved. And they took this rail car back to Berlin. They blew up the monument there to, but to ashes. That rail car would be destroyed in U.S. bombing in March of 1945, ironically. And here is the parade through Paris of British forces marching through. There is Hitler, who would spend a half day in Paris sightseeing. And that would be the only time we'll ever see Adolf Hitler in front of the Eiffel Tower. And this is one of the more famous shots. This is from a German newsreel footage, but it's a Frenchman crying on the Champs de Lyon, watching the German soldiers march through. And France would go through, most of France, four years of hell under occupation. And France would be bitterly divided over this occupation for years. France would be divided into two Frances, a northern occupied zone, so occupied by the German military with a German military rule, including Paris, and all here, they also retook Alsatian Lorraine, which they lost in World War I. This would be an independent, technically France, technically independent France, and in the, uh, actually there's a resort town, a little tiny town called Vichy, famous for its water, is a resort town in the mountains. And Marshal Henry Pétain, hero of Verdun and of World War I, he, in his 70s, would take power over the army and eventually take power over France and sign the surrender. And he would become the symbol of the government that collaborated with the Germans, even though technically they were neutral. And Italy got some land, Italy got Corsica, and the French, Vichy France, kept their colonies. It was a neutral government. Britain accepted this, but Britain had some worries, especially about the powerful French Mediterranean fleet. Well, the French would participate in the German war. A lot of French actually were bitter at the British over fleeing at Dunkirk, and they actively helped the Germans. And they would be involved in the final solution, which I'll get to tomorrow or Monday. But there would be a French resistance. In North Africa, those areas in blue on that map, those were French colonies and the massive French empire. Well, the ones in light blue stayed loyal to Vichy. So they were this neutral government. They still had an army, they still had planes. But the southern part of the French empire became part of what we call the Free French. So the French resistance revolved around this. And the Free French, they would take the French tricolors and then, and then add that cross. And Charles de Gaulle, who would lead that aborted attempt to, to cut off the German advance, he would eventually become the leader of the Free French and become the symbol of French resistance. And he was a hard man who never forgave the British for leaving, and there would be sore feelings for this. He would come back. He'd be an important part of French history to this very day. But he would come back to take power in France in the 1960s. The Marquis were the name of French guerrillas and sometimes you hear them called the underground that would fight against Germany, risk their lives to try to stop Germany, and they're going to become glorified in France, and you know what, I don't blame them. 
So, back to this. A couple things happened in rural France. Now, first off, Britain's alone. Britain pulled their troops out. An important thing to understand about this, Churchill, in power, has decided and very publicly vowed, and get this down, that he will stay in the war. We are going to stay in the war and continue to fight. We are not going to quit. I repeat, Britain vowed to stay in the war. Yeah, they seriously talked about maybe giving up part of their empire or just saying Germany can do whatever you want in the continent and quit. But, hit, but Churchill decided to stay in. If it would have been Halifax, who knows? And this is where you can make an argument that Hitler saved Western civilization. We'll see for how long, but he saved it. If he would have surrendered, Germany would have been a, maybe been able to use full force to attack the Soviet Union, and who knows? But instead, he always kept this chance for a two-front war. Churchill was at his best. And he would show his weird parts down the road, but here is at his best. And that's just a very funny publicity photo of, Hit, of Churchill holding an American Thompson submachine gun. It just looks like a gangster there. It's a good picture. But, a couple things in real quick. The United States is still neutral, and Britain knew they could never get the United States into the war, or United States aid, unless they convinced the United States that they mean they're, they're going to fight, that they're going to defeat Germany. The United States will not give aid to Britain if they think Britain's going to turn around and sign an armistice and, and quit fighting with Germany, have some kind of peace treaty. So Hitler, or Churchill, was angry about one thing. The powerful French fleet, mostly here but also in Tunis, but in Algeria, the powerful French fleet all went to anchor here after the surrender, and they were sitting there. Now, Britain was hoping they would just uh, um, sit in harbor, and sit in a neutral harbor or be de decommissioned. Britain was actually hoping they would get the ships, but they were worried that maybe Germany might get them. And so Churchill decided to do one of the most ruthless acts that France has never really forgiven Britain for, but he's doing it to convince the United States. Great Britain destroys the French fleet. They, and put this down, this was to show President Roosevelt, we mean business. British ships sailed into French, the French harbors, and they, without warning, opened up on French ships anchored in the harbors of, in Algeria, Mars al Kanep, and Tunis, and proceeded to sink or seriously destroy a number of French ships, killing thousands of French sailors. This unprovoked attack against someone who is technically now neutral would show that Britain meant business. We will do whatever it takes to win this war. So he's telling the United States, help us. Help us, we're going to finish this war. So these are a couple pictures of this. You can imagine the anger in France. So when, in the end of 1942, when Britain, U.S., and Canadian forces would attack these former Vichy colonies, or these former French colonies, now Vichy colonies in North Africa, some French forces would fight over anger over this. But the British would stay in the war. And this would lead to what we call... The Battle of Britain. But if the British Empire... Okay, I put a couple things in here, and I don't know why it's working now. But if it's... the British Empire and its Commonwealth last for a thousand years... Oh, wrong moment. Quit! But if the British... <laughs> now, this one, I planned on it. So, right away, let's go back to this map right here. Last couple things for today. Britain is alone. Germany been, began to consider a lightning-fast invasion over the English Channel and attack Britain. And 
the problem was that the, the Germans had virtually no fleet, and what fleet they did have would, would seriously damage attacking Norway. And so, with that, their plan was to dash across the 19 miles here before the powerful Royal Navy could attack them. And the plan, the operation for this is going to be called Operation Sea Line. They begin to move these like uh, coal barges from the Rhine River, flat bottom coal barges that they thought they could ram up to the beaches and pour troops out, looking like a landing craft. But they really didn't have a plan. There was no real attempt to invade. They knew that the German, the British Army was severely weakened because they had no heavy, well, most of their heavy equipment was left back in Belgium. But they had to dash across this channel. And this would lead to... Oh, uh, there's Hermann Goering right here, the head of the German Air Force. That's one of the coal boats. He's looking at Calais. And if you look over here, that's Britain. That's how close it was. On a clear day, you could see Britain 19 miles away from France. And Goering's the head of the German Luftwaffe. And what Goering said, and he was, he knew that the <sighs> September would, the, the English Channel would be so rough, it would be almost impossible to invade across the English Channel. And these are one of these coal barges, they tried to turn into a landing craft. Goering came up with the idea. This won't ever happen. And Hitler didn't think it would happen anyway. Sea Lion was always more aspirational, it was never reality. If they could knock out the Royal Air Force, knock out the Royal Air Force, Britain will have no choice but to surrender. And this would become known as, and here's my little bit of a speech, and it's taken from, <laughs> it's taken from a uh, thing that has sirens in the background for a little dramatic effect. But Churchill went on the radio a number of times and gave very inspirational speeches. Ironically, Churchill, who was a stutterer, he overcame the stutterer by having this very distinct way of talking that people would mock him for it. But on the radio, especially at this time, it sounded almost soothing. He also, a lot of times, would be either busy or drunk. He drank brandy pretty much from morning to night. He had an actor do these, so we don't know to this day which one is actually Churchill and which one's an impersonating him, but now here is Churchill talking about the Royal Air Force. That if the British Empire and its Commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will still say, this was their finest hour. See, I got it in. He's talking about the Royal Air Force, but we're coming to the Battle of Britain. And the Battle of Britain, I have to be very clear about this. The Germans never called it this. They uh, called it something else, and I did not put this in there. The Battle of Britain was just the assumption of Hitler that Britain is going to surrender. Hitler's real thought was, we bomb them, we threaten invasion, Britain will surrender because that's the rational thing. In fact, Germany always just assumed Britain never really meant to help France. They don't like them. Britain would accept that Germany should control the continent and Britain could have their empire. And this would allow Germany to turn on, on the Soviet Union. And so we're coming to the Battle of Britain. These are British civilians. This actually started in 1939. A lot of children, especially of wealthier families or middle class families, were sent to the countryside, a fear of German bombing before it actually happened, and then when the bombing hit, there would still be a number of civilians. But, the plan was this, for the German Luftwaffe to knock out the Royal Air Force. Once they knocked out the Royal Air Force, and that included knocking out air bases and factories that made planes, Britain could not defend themselves, they could not put planes over the Royal Navy and therefore they would be vulnerable to German planes. And once that happened, they would be forced to quit. But the big thing was attrition. The German Air Force was bigger than the British Air Force, the Royal Air Force. Now, the German Air Force was actually smaller than the French and German, or the British Air Force combined, 
But the French never fully committed their air force and then it's too late. So they thought if we can kill so many pilots, shoot down so many planes, and slow down production of new planes, Britain will surrender. They tried to use their Stuka dive bombers at first, but the Stuka dive bombers were so slow and unmaneuverable and such a short range that they barely had enough fuel to get over the channel and fight then get back and they were knocked down in the hundreds by British planes. And so the Stukas turned out to be a real liability. They would use them for the rest of the war, but mostly on the Russian front. Here are the planes they will use. These are Heinkel bombers, good picture of them flying over the English Channel, a low level attack. Doiner DO-17, and these were actually civilian, they were sold as civilian transport planes and then converted to military planes. They were never great bombers, they never had long range, they weren't, didn't carry a heavy enough load. Remember what I told you, the German military was not yet ready to fight. And beginning in August of 1914, did I say 1914? August of 1940, the Battle of Britain began. August and September of 1940. The Germans also had the best fighter plane in the world, at least at the beginning of the war, 1939, the Messerschmitt Bf 109. It's fast, maneuverable, but the problem was it didn't have the range. It barely could reach London from, from France, barely reached London and have maybe 10 to 15 minutes of fuel to fight before it could get back. And so what that meant was German bombers, who were not great bombers, were going to be vulnerable. And we're not going to worry about this was an attempt at a big fighter plane that failed miserably and was shot down by the British planes. The Royal Air Force was small, but it was a very effective air force. And they had a couple big advantages. First off, they're fighting over their land. There, and so they could simply scramble from fighter bases built all over Britain. And all you need for a fighter base is basically a flat field and you got a base. And so they put these bases all over it's to scatter them out to make them harder for the British to hit. And they're fighting and defending their own home ground. But the Royal Air Force had another huge advantage. You see by these planes right here. They were, fortunately for them, making two fantastic fighters that also had short range, but the Spitfire and the Hurricane. Here are Hurricanes right here, and they were slower, not as maneuverable, but durable, tough planes, and then a plane that would become a war winner, the Spitfire. And the Spitfire with its unique elliptical wings had short range, but was incredibly maneuverable, could match the Messerschmitt, was heavily armed, and would eventually turn out to be a superior fighter plane. This would be used for the rest of the war, the Spitfire. And the reason why this is such a big deal, they're already making these planes when the war began. So they didn't have to stop production, retool, and try to come up with a new plane. They could just make planes, make planes, make planes. This is kind of an issue right now. Some of you might know this. Uh, they're just uh, starting right now, places like Ford Automotive Company, to talk of retooling some of their factories for making cars to respirators. This takes months to do. Today, it took that long then. If Britain was making planes that could not match up to the Germans in 1940, and they tried to retool, Britain would have, won the ba Britain would have lost the Battle of Britain. For example, the British tanks were always kind of inferior to near the end of the war, but uh, and they couldn't really change. They were stuck with them, but not in fighter planes. So with that, but they had one more big advantage, radar. This new technology, and remember what I told you, Nazi Germany was anti-science. So they never really understood the advantage of radar. So this is a um, this is using radio waves. At first, it was radio waves that would be shot. They had these very, um, these are radar towers right here. Radio waves would be shot, and the thought was they could pick up like thunderclouds. And they would bounce off of clouds, and they would be read by radio operators. And this is just a picture of it 
all you would get is this little like staticky thing on, on a cathode ray tube. They would get through this little staticky thing and a bunch of static like this right here would show that there's something out there. And originally it was for weather prediction, for meteorology. But this could be turned into reading rate uh, if enemy attacks were coming. And here are radar operators, and you notice Britain immediately started enlisting a number of, of women into the Royal Air Force and the Army to do jobs so men could go to the front, uh, something we saw in World War I. But they couldn't tell like the exact number of planes that were coming, but they could tell a lot of planes or a few planes. The Germans never understood the radar, and they never really concerted efforts to attack radar stations, which could have worked. And so they underestimated radar's power and therefore were baffled why the British always seemed to be ready to stop them. And so eventually, here's high-level radar and short-range radar or low-level radar surrounding Great Britain. And so when German planes would come, British fighters, under what's called fighter command, could always send up a few fighter planes and chip away at them. Remember, this is a battle of attrition. Just waves of fighter planes to knock down German planes, knock down German planes. So a lot of German planes would get through, but every time they would lose more and more planes. And the Germans underestimated them. This, they thought it would be things like here is a, a volunteer air warden in Britain looking out for planes with his binoculars. And what you have in is just a few British pilots attacking German planes. And here is an attack on a German airbase. Here are the contrails of a dogfight between British and French planes. That's a, a Brit British and German planes. And here is a Spitfire that shot down. So a lot of British planes were shot down. But the important thing is this. Yeah, they lost a lot of planes. But if they're shot down, the crew might survive and they bail out over Britain and ready to fight again. If German planes are shot down, like these German bombers being hit, here's a German fighter plane shot down in a British field, their crew are taken prisoner. And here they are I'm giving a, a bottle of gin to take a shot of after he bailed out. So this is where I'm going to quit. Tomorrow I'll finish it up and start Pearl Harbor. And are there any questions? All right, so tomorrow we have a quiz. And like I said, I will take a couple, I'll uh, do the same thing on notes. I want to reward you for doing notes. I hope this isn't too hard. And the thing about it is if you're taking pictures, take a couple pictures, take a couple pages together in a picture. That way it, it's easier and I can just expand it and I can just uh, zoom in and see it. But take two pictures so you won't need as many files. And if you can make a PDF of the whole thing or slap it on a Word document, it might be easier. A few people are taking little videos of them just turning their pages of their notes and I can stop and look at it. And it's amazing how much I can see on those. A short little few minute video, that's a perfectly fine idea. Are there any questions? Okay, there'll be some more reading, a little bit of a reading assignment tomorrow. I am going to start putting up documents for you to look at. So look at that review book. Uh, there's going to be a thesis question you're going to have to write here pretty soon, but not a big deal. All right. No questions? I know this is a little awkward, a little weird, but we're going to get through this. And, uh, you know, I wish I could say I knew when we were going to come together and you could finally, we could see each other. Because remember, we uh, used to have these weird things like class. But I have no idea when it's going to happen. We're just going to have to keep uh, keep forging ahead. And one more thing, it's kind of funny how, uh, yeah, you know, class for all of us, me and you, it was work. It, it's amazing though how there are some things in there I really do miss about that. So, you know, hopefully we'll be able to at least have a few days at the end to do that. All right. On that happy note, I am stopping. Are there any questions? I'm trying to find my mouse again. Huh. I 
can't get it over to the other screen. Ah, there we go. All right, I am stopping the screen.